All right, we're ready to start, Mark. Okay. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. My name is Mark Goddard, and I'm going to be talking about the Stack HPC release train. And we're about a year into this project, and I know perhaps some of you have read the blog post that we shared on on the same topic. So this will uh, this will cover some of the same content as the blog post and some of the things that we've done or or discovered since then. So we'll look. At, uh, we'll talk a little bit about OpenStack, and um, and our journey with CentOS. Then about the release train that we uh, we built, and finally our experience and impressions with Pulp. So I'm based in Bristol in the UK. I've been working with OpenStack and high performance computing for a while now, and previously I was looking at video conferencing and Ethernet switches. So steadily floating my way up the stack. Stack HPC was founded in Bristol um, six years ago, and we work developing OpenStack capabilities for research computing use cases. We like to work with open source communities, particularly OpenStack, and the bread and butter of our business is deploying and supporting OpenStack systems. So in case anyone isn't familiar with OpenStack, it's an open source cloud computing software stack. It started in 2010, um, combining two components built by NASA and Rackspace. And they recently completed the alphabet, going all the way from Austin to the Z release, and now back to Antelope. And what is OpenStack is a very difficult question to answer, but and it has evolved over time. You might see it as being somewhere between VMware and AWS or Google Cloud, or, or perhaps something entirely different. It gets used by telcos, by um, HPC centers, by public clouds. It's, pre it's pretty flexible. But I guess the main thing that it allows you to do is to spin up virtual machines or bare metal machines and plumb them together with networking and storage. We use projects called Collar and Kyobi to deploy OpenStack. They do so using containers. And there is some Ansible plays to uh, to deploy those containers in a you know a more static configuration than you might get with something like Kubernetes. So, Another project called Kyobi adds bare metal provisioning and host configuration to the mix. So here's a little about a little history of our um, use of CentOS and related um, related events. So in September 2019, CentOS Linux 8 was generally available. And, and they announced CentOS Stream 8 at the same time, um, which was initially a, a parallel distribution with a rolling release model. OK, great. Everyone's happy. Nice new thing to play with. Just after then, the OpenStack train release was um, available. And just after the, um, the turn of the year, Python 2 became end of life. Now. CentOS 7 is very much based on Python 2 and CentOS 8 on Python 3. So there is a lot of pressure to reinstall systems with uh, CentOS Linux 8. And I say reinstall rather than upgrade because there isn't really an upgrade path between those two systems, not a supported one anyway. So quite a lot of work involved to reinstall many bare metal machines with CentOS 8. So we did that for all of our clients. Took a long time, but we got there. And towards the end of that year, the CentOS project announces, sorry, CentOS Linux is EOL. End of life. Uh, you just like lost eight years of support. CentOS Stream is the new thing that we'll be supporting. 
one of the original um, CentOS co-founders, Gregory, Gregory Kurtzer, announces Rocky Linux uh, shortly, late, shortly after, three days after. And then finally, at the end of 2021, CentOS Linux is uh, killed off. So this was a bit frustrating for us. You know, we recently reinstalled all these systems with CentOS Linux 8, and then suddenly it's no longer supported. What do we do? Should we jump onto the CentOS stream distribution? There was a lot of discussion about whether it was suitable for production or not, and what the um, the effects of using a rolling distribution might be. Should we try a rail clone? Should we abandon RPMs, move to our, uh, Ubuntu? There's a lot of discussion about this and trying to find out what the, the rest of the community was doing. But in the end, we decided we'll do it. We'll go for CentOS Stream. So what we needed to do was mitigate the risks of a rolling release distro. And one of the ways that you can do that is to use repository snapshots so that at least you have a, a fairly stable set of packages to um, to roll out. That, uh, and while they might have some issues, it's at least a known set of issues, and you could roll forward to another snapshot, which hopefully doesn't have any issues. So there's a, there's a few ifs here, but there always are in life. Has another set of issues. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's great. But how do we do that? If only there was something that could help us with this. Well, I guess you're all familiar with it, Pulp. Um, we were actually using it already at Stack HVC in 2021. We started it rolling it out for some of our deployments, um, using it as a local package mirror and contain container registry, um, sitting next to the um, our client's cloud deployment. And it would pull content from CentOS mirrors. We would build the collar container images locally and push them to the registry, and then use that pulp to um, to install packages to the uh, hosts in the cloud. So these typically here we're talking about the um, the control plane hosts and the hypervisors rather than the VMs that run on, run on top. That's um, that's more of a concern for our for the users of the cloud. So this this was working okay, and you know we were happy with Pulp. We built a bit of automation around it, um, but one issue was that each deployment had slightly different content. So the images were slightly different because they've been built locally, and the set of packages were always a little bit different because they've been synced at a different point in time. So there was still a bit of randomness in the system. So we turned to a project that had been on the backlog for a little while called the release train. And the the aim of this project is to release a set of tested artifacts and use those to deploy all of our cl uh, clients' clouds and try to keep them more in sync. So from this, we, we'd be able to uh, better reproduce um, in production what we what we have in, in test, in our test environments. And because we've got a known set of, um, of artifacts to deploy, it should be more reliable. The scope here is uh, the upstream package repositories, Cent uh, CentOS particularly, um, the collar container images, which we would now build once and um, push to the a central registry binary artifacts, so disk images and things like that, to some extent source code repositories, and the configuration that we use to deploy the clouds. Now doing all of this adds a bunch of um, new things to maintain and a bunch of new complexity. And one way to offset that is through automation and continuous integration. So we are very heavy users of Ansible, and found the, um, the pulp squeezing modules very helpful. We built up a, a collection on top of the, um, the pulp squeezer modules, which kind of just adds 
Um, the ability to define things as as lists, so you, it's a bit more sort of declarative. It adds almost a, a, a semi-declarative layer on top of the the Ansible modules. Then we've got um, various GitHub actions for CI and for doing um, scheduled uh, regular tasks like syncing and things. So we've got a bit of an eye test here. Um, I'll try and go through the diagram and explain what we've got. So at the top, we've got package, um, package repositories. We've got CentOS on the left and other various third-party mirrors on the right. And in the, in the green box, we've got Arc, which is our production pulp server. And we've got a nightly task that syncs um, the, uh, the repositories in Arc with those in the upstream mirrors. In the red, pinky red box in the middle, we've got a test pulp. And that runs on our development cloud. And it's essentially a mirror of Arc. Moving down to the, the yellow boxes, we've got um, machines that we might spin up to run tests and other machines that we might spin up to build the container images. And those those machines will um, work with the test pulp on our development cloud. So they would um, pull down the packages from that, um, that pulp server, perhaps um, run some tests or build some images. And once the images are built, push them back up to Arc, our, um, our production pulp server. On the right-hand side, we've got the client pulp services. So they, as before, are sitting next to our client deployments, next to the client clouds, and act as a sort of a, a, local, um, a local cache or a local mirror of the content in Arc. So Arc runs on Leaf Cloud, which is based in the Netherlands, and is deployed using a pulp installer and other Ansible content. It was 3.16 for quite a long time, but recently we upgraded to 3.21.2. And we're using the S3 object storage backend, which is actually provided by Ceph Rodos Gateway. For access control, we're using X509 cert guards for the packages. We've got a development cert guard and a release cert guard. We're using HashiCorp Vault for the CAs. And our clients get a client certificate signed by the release CA. On the container side, we've got you using RBAC with two different namespaces. And similarly, there's a development one and a release one. Clients get credentials in the Stack HPC uh, consumer group, which allows them to pull from the Stack HPC namespace. For syncing, we have YAML um, lists that define the repositories that we want to mirror from upstream. We've got GitHub Actions workflows that run nightly to sync with those upstream repositories, and we sync using the immediate policy because we've we saw issues with um, with on demand when packages get removed. So for each repository version, we create a distribution, and in the in the path. The, uh, the final component is a, um, a date time stamp. And we went with that because it gives you some sort of ordering of the distribution names and the paths. Um, it doesn't really have any meaning beyond that. And it's very hard to version a, um, a collection of content like that. And Every time some content is synced, we use the development cert guard um, against the distribution so that our test processes can, can reach the content, but customers can't. So the same content is then synced nightly from Arc to test pulp. On the container image side, these get built on demand using GitHub Actions to drive the Collar Builder process. And they're built on our development cloud. 
And again, they're tags using the date timestamp with the OpenStack release as a prefix. And they get pushed to this development namespace and then synced back to the test pulp. The configuration for each cloud lives in a repository, a Git repository called KOB config. And it defines um, for packages a, um, a version for each repository. So we've got an example with two, two repositories here, CentOS, AppStream, and BaseOS. Each can have a different version. And we can move those versions forward um, and control that using Git. And whenever um, a, a PR gets merged with, with these version changes, we automatically promote um, the corresponding distributions in pulp to use the release cert guard so that they're accessible to our clients. On the container side, again, we have YAML. And each, each um, container or collection of containers has a variable specifying the tag. So different components can be running at different versions, and we can control exactly which versions are deployed. The images are promoted um, manually uh, following the merge of the um, of the Git config. So it's a little bit more manual and on the container side at the moment, but we we do hope to improve that. So how do clients actually make use of this content? They have a local pulp in one server uh, deployed next to OpenStack. We can use on demand here because we know that the content in Arc isn't going away. So that, uh, that helps to speed up the, um, the syncing process. Because we've got all these different snapshots in Arc that are all um, concurrently accessible, we can move clients forward at different speeds. So if some want to be updated more regularly, that's fine. And others perhaps are happier to sit um, on a, a particular version. When you say pulp in one server, do you mean this container that has all the services running in one? Yep, that's right. OK, thanks. And then this, this pulp uh, runs slightly differently. It has two, two distributions rather than using all the versions. We've got a development distribution and a production one. And these just move forward as content gets synced in. So whenever we sync with um, with Arc, we pull it into the development distribution. And then we have to actively promote the production distribution to be the same as development um, on demand. So that works quite well um, when we have a staging environment or, or a test environment at the client site that we want to test content in before rolling out to production. So most of our clients are running the release train now. Um, that happened at the beginning of, um, of this year and the end of last year. And generally, it went fairly well. We've had a few issues with, uh, with Pulp over that time. Um, in the, the RP, RPM and dev world, we had issues with publications not being uniquely identifiable. So they don't have a, a, um, um, a name in the same way that um, distributions and, um, and repositories do. And the pulp squeezer module can get into trouble if there are multiple publications per repository version. And that can help happen um, if you are um, doing doing a sync and the metadata is regenerated without the content changing. We've seen that a few times. And you end up with multiple publications. So then there's a, um, I think what we do is we try, we, we try to create a, um, a distribution uh, based on a particular repository version, but Squeezer can't find a unique publication for it. Uh, there is a, a bug about it. Um, I think at the moment, we just go through and delete the um, extra publications to work around it. 
which isn't ideal because it means we're using the old one. <coughs> um, we often see syncs fail on invalid checksum. I guess this is probably not Pulp's fault. Perhaps it's due to non-atomic upstream changes in the mirror. Maybe we should reach I, I'm not sure. Um, we see that Pulp stages all the content locally during a sync, um, which you might not notice with the file backend, but with S3 object storage, this seems to involve a lot of network traffic, pulling all the packages down. And if you've got a large repository, it can eat a lot of local storage. So for example, our, um, our Pulp VM doesn't actually have enough storage to sync Ubuntu focal repositories at the moment. So we had to uh, throw those away. Um, we've seen sync tasks get wedged for, for days and then block this blocks further syncs of the same repository. Perhaps tasks need a timeout. I'm not sure. We Mark, have you had, can I ask a quick question? Have you, do we have an issue open, especially for that last one? Because I had not seen that before. I haven't raised one myself. I didn't okay. check. Um, I'll do some digging. Thank you. Uh, and also yeah. related to that, one of the questions, so we've had some problems um, in various versions of code paths that had bugs in them around causing tasks to become um, stuck in various ways. So we haven't seen one of these in, in a while. So with your, if you're running 321, I think I heard you said you upgraded there. I would yep. not expect something like that. So if you do reobserve it, particularly on that release, we would really like to hear about that. Okay, yep. noted. On the container side, we um, had issues with slow container pushes, taking, um, I think we saw over six hours to push all our images to pop in, at one point. We haven't done any um, proper testing, but we're hoping that the um, lovely name of um, cross repository blob mount um, will help us here in 321. Hopefully, that will speed us up. Um, we it does still seem to be quite slow syncing from Arc to the um, to the client's um, container registry. It might be due to the way we're driving Pulp Pulp's API. It's fairly serial at the moment. Might look into way of ways of trying to parallelize that so we can get more tasks spinning at the same time. And when we run parallel container pushes, we see various errors. This is, these are all from the client. Um, unsure exactly what's going on here. We haven't really dug into it that much, but um, perhaps things getting overloaded or, yeah, not sure. Um, the, the use of separate content guards um, is a bit, um, bit of a pain. So we're currently testing out um, RBAC content guards for our RPM and DEB content, hoping that will make our lives a bit simpler and we can, um, we can kill off the HashiCorp Vault service. The squeezer modules don't have complete API coverage. Um, we've added support for things we need. Um, whether that's um, modules or parameters. Um, and I think we're okay for the moment. And we've seen issues with pulp in one and performance. This one I think was coming from um, uh, from from the database. We we added this max request 10 to the G Unicorn CLI. which seemed to help. Have you filed an issue about this? Because it would be good for us to fix this for everyone. <clears throat> I don't know if we have. OK. Um, I can ask about that. Cool. I think we weren't sure how good a fix workaround this is. Yeah, Might yeah. I think we should investigate this some more, for sure. Yeah. This seems like a, a serious performance problem. Yeah. On the upgrade side, we upgraded recently. Um, 
we had some issues with um, co-installability of some of the um, projects, issues with cryptography and PyOpenSSL versions. There was a bug. Um, I think the fix was going through. There was an issue with um, pulp RPM migrations, which don't work when the back end is S3. Um, again, I think there was a fix going through. And there were, we got a bit um, surprised by the uh, the user and group to our back migration, but probably should have um, understood the release notes better, but wasn't a big problem in the end. And this is quite a nice quote from uh, one of my colleagues. I don't viscerally hate it in the way that I do Vault. Um, and I think coming from Matt, that's a compliment. Um, but you know, seriously, the Pulp is a, um, a nice piece of software that that does help us to provide reliability and repeatability for our deployments, which is very important to us. Um, it's not; it's never going to be the lead actor for us. It, it's playing a supporting role to OpenStack and and other projects. But you know, so in that sense, we're looking for something that just works. It's probably not quite there yet, but it does seem to be improving pretty quickly. I like the API and the abstraction seem to work well in Pulp 3, even if at first you think, oh, well, there's quite a lot going on here. But I think it does all make sense. The object storage model is nice. Our back seems to be moving on. I like there does seem to be a deployment tooling flux at the moment. It would be nice oh. to get a sort of uh, a direction on um, a sense of the direction on where that's going. Thanks. So that's I think that's pretty much the end. Some references in case anyone wants to read uh, the link. There's a link to the slides on the schedule. But um, thank you everyone for listening, and thank you for building great software. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, this was great. You're yeah, and, exactly. and also thank you for all the contributions to whatever plugin or client tooling we have. This is very great. Yeah, Mark, thanks a lot. Um, we have two minutes till the next uh, talk, so I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Uh, but if uh, Mark, if you want to discuss more things with us or have some back and forth discussions, we we have time slots at the end of the days for open discussion. In case you have time and want to join, um, that would be great. Um, because like right now we are we we, we are out of time. Um, but uh, it was great presentation. Thanks for sharing. Um, how you use Pulp and the challenges um, you run into is really important for us um, to to understand, you know, our, how how it really is um, from the usability perspective. So, greatly, greatly appreciated, and we we're very happy that uh, you guys are using it. Yeah, hey, thank you, thank you for listening. Um, yeah, I'll try and make uh, at least one of those sessions. Um, we've got a busy week. We've got a um, sort of conference slash summit ourselves this week so um i'll try and find some time between that to uh, to attend thank you well and if anything you can always reach us out on our you know discourse and metrics and um all the other um, communication channels sure so, thanks a lot